So he's going to talk to you next about the brain internal state continuation somewhat of his previous talks. And then we had a question earlier, if the person is still here, we can continue that discussion on that. So I'll let um, Professor Lee, please. Yeah, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, so this is my third talk this week. And the first talk was given for the, the neurobiological background on the deep learning by understanding what kind of information processing is done in our brain may come up with better network architecture and learning algorithm. That was the goal for the first talk. For the second talk, I talk about how to improve the performance for specific goal. And then today, the last talk I have is try to show how we can come up with new applications, not where no data is available. Obviously, then you need to do the data collection and design experiment first. So the topic today is understanding brain internal state for next generation chatbot. And in other words, I know how you think and who you are. So it's, some people may think it's quite scary. But I think if you are not hiding anything, then you are not. You don't need to be afraid of. So it's a good thing to see in the open society. That's how you're looking at it. But before I go on, I try to have one slide that I missed yesterday because I, yesterday I talked about some of several things, and one of them was emotional text to speech. And unfortunately, I couldn't get the speech data. So I try to show some of the speech synthesis data that depend on the emotional status. And unfortunately, this is written, this is for Korean, but you know, emotional content, you don't need to worry about the language. Just hear and you may feel some emotional content in it. This is natural thing. So maybe you can hear similar thing for any TTS system available. So do you think that she is happy? Sad. Okay, so the only thing I said here is we have a simple control mechanism or latent variable on this tapotron or wave net, then you can control the emotional content even from the same the text data. The main topic today is how to come up with new research topic and new research goal. And this is the thing I usually say, whenever you try to set research goal in the future, this is the technique I used to it. I'm still using it. So and you have two different time scales. This is current time and this is future. To look for the proper research goal you'd like to do for 10 years from now on, the way I usually say is, let's see what kind of society we will have for 20 years later. Then we may see what kind of technology need to be supported to have this kind of future society. Then from this technology, you have top-down estimation on what technology needs to be done for the 10 years. And then you also have bottom-up predictions for the 10 years. If you have some common ground for both bottom-up and top-down, then maybe the area you may work on in this type of sense. So you try to, there is a lot of bottom-up prediction, but this top-down is not available then your prediction may not necessarily be accurate. So, but if you have two things together, then you may be quite happy or confident on your research goal. The okay, next question is how to predict the future. So you know there are histories, a lot of big guys like Watson or the Bill Gates, they all predicted pretty bad in some histories. So prediction is really difficult job, but one thing you may say is try to see sci-fi movie. 
Star Trek is one of my favorite movies, and especially as they say is the Star Trek, the first part for epilogue, they say, here no man has done before. They are trying to look for it, but again, this man is not necessarily male, so it should say that like now here no one has done before. So that area, so in the research domain, you also need to look for where no one has already accomplished this thing. That's the thing we do. And this year, SCES, last month, the slogan for the CES is actually one of the entrance of the CES booth Las Vegas. Actually, there is a Samsung logo there, but that's not important thing for me. What I'm interested is, this is important law, they say, do what you can. That's another important message. So many people just try to do what they are good at. But if you just try to do something you are good at, it, the improvement is not much because you just do something better. But if you do this, do what you cannot at this moment, then you can do many more, then your value on the society will be increased. Therefore, when I said, try to set up new research goal, you need to look for where no one has done before, and also uh, you do not know how to do. Then the accomplishment will be very good. In that sense, my goal is checkbook or conversational agent. So this one is probably, you know, Amazon Echo. And what is the most useful for uses of Amazon Echo in your cases? I see majority of cases, they say, Alexa, play the music, play Beatles. That's actually about half of the uses of Amazon Echo at this moment. That's not what we want. That's a very silly thing. So we need to have conversation with this agent, not just the giving command and the machine just to follow the command. So we need to have conversation between human and agent in this smartphone, or it may have a robust way, or you may see similar in the many sci-fi movies. So we need to have conversation, human-like conversation. Then, what do we mean by human-like conversation that include the emotional contact in it? So in that sense, we are interested in developing the personal assistant that has audio and video, but in the final goal of this doing some action, to, do, to make the action, you need to make decision. To make decision, you need to understand the situation. Obviously, to understand the situation, you need to have proper knowledge base. Also, you have proactive or self-identity. But today, I talk more on this situation. So, without understanding the situation, your decision may not necessarily be appropriate or accurate. So, the question is how to make proper situation and there are three ways we can do research goals. So if one, okay, once you define the real research goal somehow, in my case is situational awareness, then how to do actually the goal, achieve the goal. Here I show again, if you have some method, algorithm, how to achieve the goal, don't bother with deep neural network, just to do it. Okay. But majority of cases for AI community, that we are setting the goal, is we don't know how to do it. Then, there are also two possibilities. One is, even though we don't know how to do it, but we have enough data. Then you may just try any deep neural network, network architecture and learning algorithm and train the network. Of course, it depends on how I mean by now, but if you really have huge database, majority of system may work you okay, at least for the first stage. But if that is not available, for example, the new application you set, obviously there will be no 
they are available. Then you need to start from scratch, and then you need to develop new models and then new systems. And using this new model and new system, you may collect the data and then keep on improving at the site. It's similar to the making snowman or snowboard. To make a big snowball, the first thing is you need to just scrabble all the snowballs on certain size and then make the snowball at certain threshold size. That is the first thing. But once you have certain size of snowball, you get us to throw it on the snow. Then it will keep on bigger and bigger. So the tactic, if you want to accomplish something from nothing, the first thing you need to do is try to make something. And then keep on improving that the performance. However, to make this new model, you need to have understanding on how humans are doing that. Also, you also need to know the domain knowledge and the URL theory, which is mathematical statistics altogether. So if this can be a good background for you, then you may need less trial and error to come up with better results. But if there is no knowledge is available, no human approach, you don't know anything, also no domain knowledge available, then you need to make that knowledge by yourself by conducting cognitive neuroscience experiment. So the one, the topic I'm talking today is how we can design and implement cognitive neuroscience experiment for the understanding of human internal state for situation awareness. This picture, can you say this picture, and then you may say understanding what kind of situation it is, there are many ways currently working on so-called the feed photo captioning that is used on by the current deep learning algorithm. But again, if you look at these two guys, one guy has gone, the other guy has two hands up, it's lovely probably, and if you look at background, there is English and the liquor store and cigarette pack. So we may understand this situation as a liquor store library in United States or UK or Australia or New Zealand. Right? However, some cases, these two guys are friends and they are just trying to make fun of each other, like playing game. But my AI or intelligent robot saw so this is actual robbery and kill this guy then there will be a war starting between human and robot. We don't like that. So to avoid that, we need to understand this situation not only from the explicitly shown information like the gun and to end up, to stand up type of thing. You also need to understand what's inside of these two guys' brain. They are really having robbery situation or they are just to make fun of each other. That's what I mean, one example of brain internal state. To accomplish this goal, in addition to understand this 5W and 1H type of thing to report the situation, we need to understand something inside our brain. And in that sense, we need to understand situation. Currently, a lot of cases, the situation awareness is involving from the environment. It doesn't consider the human. I'll talk about one example there. But in the future, I need to see what's going on in our mind or brain. And that should be an important part of the situation awareness. So before we go on pre human internal state, I'll talk about some of the situation awareness from the environment. And one of my former students actually came up with a simple environmental monitoring software on smartphone. So you can turn on your smartphone 24 hours a day. But you cannot turn on your camera 24 hours per day. Why? The battery, power consumption. 
for utilizing the microphone on and turn on the microphone 24 hours, then he was able to classify the surrounding sound into many different categories. One big category was the scene, that means where the owner of the smartphone is in the bus or a car or a subway or a bus terminal, department store, subway platform, a car conference room, office, stairway, or even restaurant or street. So this is a category that can need to be classified from the surrounding sound. Also, the several even need to be identified when the people work on the computer keyboard or listening music and talking with other people and just watching TV, etc. The last category is from context that actually means where my smartphone is inside my pocket or it's in the open spaces. So he was able to identify this surrounding and events based on the microphone signals 24 hours a day and he actually worked on 100 collected data from 100 people each people used their smartphone in many different situations for two weeks so that's actually what I mean, starting collect data and while they do that, the final result for classification accuracy was one category was about 90% accuracy it's pretty good that's actually for this one, where the smartphone is inside the pocket or outside the pocket. All the others, performance is not that impressive, or somewhere between 50 to 60 percent. But as you see, there are many categories, more than I think 40 categories, including event and etc. So this accuracy is not that high. But still, you can do some services based on this estimation of the surrounding. So, one of the things you can understand the surrounding or situation based on microphone or environment is one thing. The main topic I have today is the situation awareness from human, because human is the most important part that can had effect on the situation. So, for example, this one, you know these two people are falling in love, they are not fighting each other. You are also, when you see this, you see he is quite suspicious on something. Or this one, you may say this guy is playing gambling and try to make bad effect or the try to cheat the other guy times. So that kind of thing inside the human need to be understood correctly to understand the situation. So that's the main goal we have. Once we have that kind of goal, and then you need to see some kind of mathematical uh, modeling and what kind of categories the internal state have. So the, there are many different definitions on the internal state. So this is the, my definition on brain internal state. The action or decision making of a people at time n is function of the audio and video and other sensory data and something else. That actually means even though there are same audio and video other sensory data coming, the decision may be different from person to person and even for the same person may be different from time to time. How do make that differences? That difference is coming from the brain internal state. That's actually your recurrent neural network model, right? So in your recurrent neural network model, even though you have the same input, the output may be different just because your internal state has different values. So the internal state is actually mine in our cases, all internal state. However, to make it also know that from the recurrent network, the mine or internal state does not stay at the same value. It is keep on changing as, a, as 
the new internal area of the mind is modified by the sensory data and the action and also the previous internal state. So using this kind of recurrent network model, we may come up with better understanding on the environment and try to provide better services for the world. This is a simple mathematical model. You have auditory and vision signal, the output, there are internal brain state. Actually, this is the another representation of the so popular recurrent neural net model. So that's the starting point. We like to come up with the classification of brain internal state, and that state may give you different action on behavior or situational awareness for any human machine interface. When you start in that way, the new research area, obviously there is no data available. And even in these cases, you don't know what kind of classes are appropriate for human internal variable or mind. For example, one of the internal variables we discussed yesterday is uh, human emotion. But for human emotion is relatively well studied than the other internal state. So everybody, not everybody, majority of people agree upon what kind of emotional categories are available, like happiness, sadness, angry, fear, disgust, etc. So everybody agree with it. But if you are interested in the other type of brain internal state, we don't know what kind of classes they are available. So we need to set up some hypothesis on the internal state spaces. One example, if you are interested in vision, maybe you know the, the basic component starting the low image layer, the low feature is the edge, and if you are interested in auditory, you also have frequency component given to its emphasis, and for emotion, you already know this. Then the next question is, what are the other internal state and how we can classify that. So we come up with some hypothesis on the brain internal state or the mind state. It should have several different uh, dimensional axes and obviously emotion is one or two different uh, axes because some people come up with two or three dimensional representation of emotion because the angry, happiness, disgusting, they are not also not access to each other. Even though many people are working on seven different emotional status, they know they are not also not to each other, so they come up with two dimensional or three dimensional space that cover everything. But in addition to that, we are looking for several, these three different axes. Oh, okay, there are also personality is another way of doing, because different personality will result in different behavior. Also, the other people are also working on lie detector. Lie, whether you try to lie or, or try to check your, the intention is another dimension, but, but I'm not working on that. So what I'm working on is three different Thing. The first one is during two people or human and machine interact and conversate, then whether the, you agree or disagree with your conversational partner. Especially in Asian community, the student usually do not say to their professor, say, I don't agree with you. Can you do that? Can you say, can you discuss with supervisor and say, can you say, I don't agree with you? Probably not, right? In Western community, that's not that rare. But in Asian community, the students usually are quite shy to say no. But as a professor, you need to understand actually whether my student is agree with me or not. Otherwise, one week later, I found they need something different that actually waste our time. So we need to understand what our, the other people understand my statement or my intentions. That's one thing. The second thing is where the people trust or distrust me, etc. The third one is the memory, what kind of memory information. Because 
depends on the memory that is coming from experience. So it depends on different experience, your result, your action or decision making also be different. So I'll talk about these three different things. And basically, they have different time scale to change because this internal state is changing as a function of time. But the question is how they are changing in, as a function of time. Personality, people never change their personality. Not actually never, but not in 10 minutes or 10 years. Maybe 50 years they may change. So memory is less than emotion, maybe every 10 minutes they can change the emotion, but this intention, agree or disagree or trust may be changing very rapidly. For example, the agree or disagree may change for every dialogue people are making. Trustworthiness, trust to the counterpart may not change by every sentence, every dialogue, either keep on increase or decrease time, with slow variations. So we are talking about that. So basically, I'll talk these three different things. But again, I come up with hypothesis on the brain internal state. So I have three different possible axes. But that's not science at this moment, because it's just my hypothesis. There is no proof on it. So if you don't have this good scientific knowledge everybody agree upon, then the way we do conduct research is set hypothesis and then somehow design experiment and conduct experiment to find the my hypothesis is good or bad. So we need to come up with experiment. For example, if you have the you trust or distrust, then to collect the data you need to have labeling, but the human labeling may not necessarily be correct because they can hide something. So we need to measure some brain signal to label the data, whether he agree or disagree or trust or distrust. So you the, we need to measure some of the brain signal to come up with labeling functions of the system. And then there is this picture coming from the neuroscience textbook, what kind of measurement technology we can utilize for. As you see, the horizontal axis here is the time resolution of the measured signal. The vertical axis is the physical resolution, size resolution thing. And then as you see, around this level, the one millimeter, below one millimeter spatial resolution, all these technology are basically invasive technology. They need to put electrode inside the brain. And I don't like that because I don't want somebody to put electrode into my brain. So I cannot use this thing. So all the available technology I can use is about one millisecond spatial resolution. And as you see, the functional MRI here has about one second resolution. So one second resolution is not that good resolution. And we have MEG or EEG as more temporal resolution. So the way we usually see in cognitive experiment for human, we usually use functional MRI or EEG signal. These two are most common technology to measure human brain activity. So if you try to use these two measurements, and then you may say one millimeter spatial resolution means there are a lot of neurons within one millimeter resolution. Also, the temporal resolution of one second, you know the electronic spike is usually coming around 100. Electronic spike may come within one second. So the one millimeter spatial resolution and one second temporal resolution are basically very bad. You cannot measure single neural, acti neural activity from single neuron. What you actually measure is the average property of a lot of neurons in one second. So that means 
you cannot actually measure the seed and understand what's going on exactly inside your brain. You may see is you may see outside the when people are basting, you have a glasses and the glasses come up with the foggy breath, but you can look of the other people using the ground grass or foggy grass. That kind of thing you are measuring actually. So how you can understand it, that kind of full spatial and temporal resolution that many people actually ask me many, many times. And this is the answer I usually provide. So a blind man try to figure out how the elephant looks like. So these are, we have 10 blind men they just touch some area of the elephant, so they found by touching it, because they are blind, they don't know the whole thing, they're just touching it of the different places of the elephant, come up with some information on them. Then we need to figure out, from this data, we need to figure out the whole elephant information. That's similar to what I said. One way we do is try to put spatial relationship among this 10 elephant, ah, 10 blind men. So this man is here and this man is here. So if you locate the temporal spatial relationship among these 10, 10 blind men, you come up something like this. Still, it is not easy to figure out what's going on in the brain. Then you may fill in this missing link using some knowledge, in our cases, information theory or statistical theory or not. One example I said here is, if you have edge, this edge may be extrapolated outside of the domain. So I extrapolate everything on this line. Then what do you see? You see something like animal, right? But even in these cases, it is not clear whether it is actually elephant or cow or horse, etc. Then we have some temporal relationship. I mean, this is just one image, but you have the video of it. Then you may see So can you see what this one is? Maybe you already seen it the results, so you know this is people walking, but even though you don't see that clearly, if you have temporal thing you can easily see that it's actually human body. The same way, if you have this temporal relationship among many of the images, then you can figure out this nose and the leg are different things, and you may figure out this is elephant. So this is the general way we try to understand neuroscience or how information processing is handled in our brain using pretty bad measurement technology. So we have very poor spatial resolution and poor temporal resolution. So there are many missing links. So we can fill in that missing link based on our information theory or domain knowledge. Therefore, we can come up to understand the brain. So this is the point I like because we need some fill in the missing link. That comes from the ability of researchers. So different researchers may come up with different technology to fill in the missing link. So they some may come up with good results, some may come up with bad results. That depends on the ability of researchers. It's not just the game of the big expensive equipment. If, and some research requires only big expensive equipment and a lot of people to do good result, that may not be interesting to me. Or maybe the same to you, because that's the game all the big guys always win. We can, the small guys like us, and not have any chance to win against the big guy. If that's done only by big equipment and a lot of people. However, in this domain, we have capability to fill in the missing link. That is the technology or the ability we need to have.
Okay, so what now we say we like to do the, some brain internal state and classify it. And then, but we can measure it use, using functional MRI and EEG signal. But the label, so utilizing the signal for labeling, but in actual practice, we cannot use functional MRI at least. Because there's very big equipment. You can, the final result to understand each other's internal, brain internal state is to work on near time, near spaces when people are talking to each other. Functional MRI cannot be utilized that way, it's too expensive, and the machine costs 3 million US dollars. EEG is still better because these days there are cheap the dry electrode technology that can measure the brain activity in very cheap price but still they are not robust at this moment. They are very sensitive on the noise. If you just walk, they will change a lot of noise coming. Therefore this technology is not good enough to finish at the end. The final practical application cases, we need to have audio and video at most. That's what you like to do because that's most common, the user interface between human and machine. But the measurement technology I rely on is functional MRI EEG, so there is still a big gap. So what I said is, I'm still in this level, at the top level, try to identify brain internal state using functional MRI and EEG and also later eye tracking systems but that's for development purposes I try to utilize that signal to label the audio and video signal and then using that label I will try to train my system that only allow audio and video input in the later thing so at this moment I just try to utilize the, how the brain signal actually come up with the label operation. So this again, I emphasize again how we can conduct this cognitive neuroscience experiment. The first stage is the hypothesis, and the second stage we need to design experiment that can prove or approve, disprove the hypothesis. Because again, the reason the design experiment phase is important is the measurement technology is pretty bad. So at this moment, we may say, prove, agree or disagree, or prove the hypothesis, or disprove the hypothesis binary classification only. To do so, we need to have good design, and then we conduct experiment, and then come up, the final result may be of seven digit the hypothesis. If my hypothesis got rejected here, then I need to come up with new hypothesis and go through again until I can accept my hypothesis. The measurement is usually done this way and some of the experimental room I have a human subject and you have EEG or functional MRI facility and then to interact with the people but instead of the, the other people you have the computer screen or the speakers. So this this is supposed to be the another people or AI agent and then these people are supposed to, to make conversation with each other then we need to measure the brain signal while these people are going on. I'll talk about three different hypotheses today. The first one is whether I agree or disagree with the people. The second one is I trust or distrust this guy. The third one is what kind of preference they have. So for the first one, agree or disagree that has been published in the high degree transaction and journal of cognitive neuroscience and basically what we have is we measure human subject functional MRI and EEG signal while they are seen some of the displays like this. So this is starting one prior is looking like this. I mean they starting from some fixation that means that just let the subject need to prepare for the actual experiment. 
and then among four to eight seconds, we show a sentence. And then we measure the responses, brain responses, and also we, in some cases, we ask the subject to push button that represent whether people agree with the sentence or disagree with the sentence. So we have two different models, the output modality. One is the user report by pushing button. The other one is measuring the functional MRI and EEG signal. For functional MRI signal, we usually compare the two different cases, whether people agree or whether people don't agree, is there any brain signal differences between these two. So when people agree and disagree, we will come up with brain signal differences and certain area. And then we identify this colored area is the area where is agree and disagree come up with differences. That means if for later applications, I can just look at this signal fMRI on this area and measure this one and maybe identify whether the subject agree or disagree. The same thing can be happen in the EEG signal. The same way we conduct, we show some sentences and measure the EEG signal. The analysis of EEG signal usually has done by two different methods. Because the EEG signal is something like this, as a function of the time. And then the way we analyze this one is called the temporal domain up as a function of time. Or we convert this into spectrum domain using the Fourier transform or short time Fourier transform and come up with different frequency band. You may heard of it, the alpha band, beta band, theta, delta, or we have different frequency band that has been studied already. That means certain frequency are related to certain human function. That has been already. So we come up with two different analysis. One in the, uh, the temporal domain, the other is in frequency domain. Then we train multilayer perceptron or the SVM, etc. We haven't done deep learning. That means the only thing we have so far is done is two layer, uh, three layer perceptron. We haven't gone that far just because the data we made is very tiny. But we need to go on the further. But so if it's, you're just looking at time and frequency, uh, time and amplitude of some area on your brain, there are blue line and the red line, then actually the blue line is the signal and subject agree with the sentence, and the red line is where the signal and subject don't agree with the sentence. They just see there are differences in certain signal, certain frequency, area, certain the brain area. So again, by looking at the signal at certain area at certain time, you can identify the whether people agree or disagree on your subject. And you can do that the same time frequency analysis. And the same thing, we come out of region and so again. And then again, we utilize this technology for unknown brain signal and classify whether the subject agree or disagree. There are the binary cases, the random choice is 50% accuracy, but in our cases, we have around the 70 to 75% accuracy. That means by measuring your EEG signal, and you are talking with other people, by measuring your EEG, I can identify whether you agree or disagree with 75% accuracy. 75% accuracy is not that good, but you know there is no other thing available at this moment. So even 75% is much better than 50%. So you can train your network with these pseudo labeled operations. The next topic is trustworthiness, where you agree or you trust or distrust the other people. 
the same thing, but before I go on the details here, I also need to talk about what we mean by trust. See, when people trust the other people, what kind of property people need to have to get trust from the other? So in the previous case, agree or disagree is just a one-dimensional parameter. However, the trustworthiness, when people trust, it is not a single axis, single variable operation. When you look at the cognitive science literature, old days, here I borrow from 1983, Barbara's paper, people have three different components to trust the other people. The first one is persistence. So you should be the same today and tomorrow at the same situation. Otherwise, people don't trust you. It's obvious, right? The second one is ability. You, are, you should be capable of doing the job. Otherwise, people will not trust you. The third one is called benevolence. It actually means you should have good intention to help each other, you, to collaborate or something. So three different axes are important for the trusting to each other. That has commonly used in seven I have three different axes for the trustworthy axis, but what I'm interested is not the trust between humans. What I'm interested in is, you know, the conversation between human and machine. So the trust, actually what I mean is trust of a human to conversational agent or machine. Right? Therefore, the conversational agent or machine are supposed to be persistent unless they are infected by computer virus. Right, because when you develop conversational agent, you develop that the system persists. So I'm not worrying about this part, but I add another one called human-like cue. So where my complete conversational agent has human-like faces or robot-like faces doesn't make any differences to attract trust of the human. So let's come up with, instead of removing this persistent, I add human like you. So I have three different axes to investigate for the trust, human trust on machine. In that cases, again, I forgot to emphasize that to design and cognitive science experiment with human, it's kind of different from experiment with electronic systems or computers. Because the electronic system or computer usually work well. You do something and they exactly show the result. It's like persistent. But human, you collect, you advertisement, say, okay, I need this kind of experiment. Please share your time and come to my lab to do that. Then I pay you some money. I usually pay 20 US dollars per hour. So sometimes, people are not cooperating to each other. They just come to my lab and I try to measure it, sit up in the fMRI room. And fMRI facility is very easy to sleep. So sometimes people just sleep there. I don't see any results coming. So to overcome that problem, I need to entertain the human subject to collaborate with my research. The best way we found is let them play game. By letting do playing game, they specify the experiment, the information I need to have. That's the best thing I do. So I have two different uh, paradigms of experiment to measure the trustworthiness of the human to machine. But today I just talk about the player by player game. I mean, the human and machines are playing same game, like Go game. Right. They are bilateral. So the, for the Go game, you have black people, white 
the black stone and white stone, they are keep on alternating, they have no differences. So that's what I mean in these bilateral cases. Human and machine is a iterative game. The other one is something different because they assume a computing agent is doing their job and human is watching out as a supervisor mode or coach mode. So whether this guy is doing well, then supervisor doesn't do anything at all. But if this guy is not doing well, then supervisor will interrupt. Right? And people like in the autonomous vehicle, what you will do? If you're just looking at your book or video while your autonomous vehicle is driving, that means you are trusted the machine too much and you may get killed and the autonomous vehicle get accident. If you don't trust this on autonomous vehicle, then you can just be looking at whether this guy is driving well or not and your foot is on the great peril just behind the report of action. That means you don't use any autonomous vehicle. You do not get advantage using autonomous vehicle. So too much trust, too less trust are both no good. You need to have certain trust level between human and machine to make the collaboration more efficient. But at this moment, I just report this guy. So when two people are playing games, and then how the trust of the human is affecting to each other. In that area, many people talk about theory of mind game. That actually means is these blue guys and green guys are alternating the game, and but the decision of the blue guy may be considering if I do this, then my opponent will do this. Way. That all he may say. If I do this, my opponent will do this, but this, uh, my opponent will also consider my next move, etc. So how many steps each people predict the other guys to make final decision? So that's kind of capability or ability to relate it to the trust. If you can simulate or predict several more steps, you obviously have an believe the opponent very well. This is the game, the called Matrix game, I borrow from my friend Jun Zhang in the University of Michigan in the Cognitive Science Department. Uh, he has, you have four, the screen come out with four different areas, A, B, C, D, and each area, they come out with two different numbers. And the first one is the payoff of player one, the second one is payoff of player two. And then player one and player two are alternating the game. And they are, they are doing is they have two choices. They can either stop at this current position or they can move to the next position. So player one may stop here or move to here. Then player two can either stop here or move here. Then play one is again may stop here or move to here. So the goal is two cases. I have two different games. One is so called egoist game, the other is collaboration game. The egoist game is the play each player try to make best benefit pay off for himself or herself. Don't consider it the other guy. For collaboration game, they try to maximize the sum of these two guys, so different factors. So that collaborative or egoist is another axis called the benevolence or goodwill in my previous there's an exit hypothesis on trustworthiness. So for example, in this game, in this number, so you have these four different numbers come in. Player one starting here. That means player one has two dollars and player two got three dollars if he stop here. If he move here, then the player two will make decision. The player two may say player two, if he stop here, he got two dollars, but if he move to here, he only got one dollar. 
the player two may stop here. Right? However, if player two is capable, say, PC may think, okay, I, if I move here, then my opponent will not stop here. My opponent will move from here to there because my opponent will have better player. So that means, depends on how I believe in my opponent capability, my decision will be different. So that's the basic characteristic of this game. So we have both myopic cases, that means the player B doesn't look for these cases. How did it happen my uh, next guy? But also predicting case capability. So that come up with the game different uh, functional MRI positions. And also we do the same thing for the experiment. Oh, and then I forgot to mention this human like you. So before, while they are doing this game, so the first player may start either here or move to the next one. The next one is supposed to be made by the computer agent. The computer agent may stop here or move to the next stage. But at that time, to simulate or emulate the human like you, I put human faces here. And then the also sound is, OK, move to the surface, etc. Or with that human like face, they just do, on, do any human on his face, they just uh, move the color from the again. So can I use this human-like face and speech with and without? There are differences on the brain signal. That means human-like Q affect the signal differences. They also say the differences in EEG signal and functional MRI signal. And the result said Partners' human-like cues did not affect a participant's behavior performance. Behavior performance means how soon, what is the time interval to make actual decision, and how accurately they predict the others. Also, different is signal parent by partner's technical confidence was more evident and partner as human-like cues. So what this one is most important part. So depends on the partner's technical competence, that means the partner may just look at their own decision, or the partner consider. If they make decision, then I will go on kind of decide, make it. So that kind of capability greatly affected on the different brain signal. That's what I have. Also, that differences become bigger when we have human like cues exist on the Asian. So then the Asian has human faces and speeches. That's the main thing we do. So that means if you want to have the collaboration or the converse, good conversation between human and machine, it is better to have human-like faces and speeches and also try to come out with the high confidence or high, the prediction or theory of mind game. The last topic is user authentication. So when you use your smartphone or your computer, they usually ask for the password. But that's not a good way because I usually forget my password. I try to several times again and again. Then right now many people use fingerprint and don't iris detectors. So fingerprint and iris are the most safe technology at this moment, but however, Somebody can fake it. Somebody can copy a copy of the fingerprint easily. And even the iris, if you have a good camera video, they can emulate. So the next thing is how to do is the best way to identify a person is having interview. That's the way you do, right? So whenever you try to identify one people, you bring him and ask a question and see what kind of answer is coming. By just having one question and answer, the confidence may not be high. But if you do many of them, then you can really identify the person. There's no way you can pay you. The problem of this interviewing approach is it takes too much time. If you do interview by speech, it takes too much time. 
the way I do it, the question is made by images. The answer is detected by eye scan. Then you can do it question and answer in very that manner. This is some example. I show four different images on the computer screen and measure where the eyes are moving around. I'm sorry for this girl, but unfortunately, almost all the people look at these beautiful three people faces, never go to this one. So, it's human preference. It's, you cannot control whether you see all this pattern. Okay, you may say, I can control my eye movement. You may say that way. So we did actually experiment that people move their eye in this manner. They can move their eyes slowly. Or they can fix, fixate your eye on this specific position. But they cannot move fast. Because the, usually, and you see, all this movement coming within one second without your any intention in work. You're just looking at your eye is just doing all the scan. You cannot control that intention, your, your intention. That means nobody can fail or skill this eye travel. Okay? So this is most safe technology you have. And how this is related to brain internal state? This one we look for preference or previous knowledge. Obviously, if you know one of these people or some, I show some of the natural scene and food or animal or the computer, all kinds of things I show it. So there are coming based on your preference. Your eye go to the images you prefer for a long time or in the order. So that way, that is related to the, your internal state. And this is the paradigm I have. So I show this fixation time and showing two, four different images. And then again, this single trial is not good enough to come up with high confidence authentication. I need to do it many, many times. Right? How many times? In our experiment, actually, I did 110 different trial for each. And actually, for one day, I did twice of the same experiment, and actually they also have two different experiment paradigm. One case is I ask them just to say, just to look at the images. Or another case is I ask them try to see which image you prefer. So there are two different. One is free scanning, the other is test scanning, and we found the test cases is more accurate than the other. So these are another several experiments and you have different images, your eyes are moving around. So when I say it this way, then reviewer said, you know, human trust, human preference is changing. Right? So if we, the people's preference can change, what happened? You, so what he did is, we have three weeks, so one week, one week later, and so another week later. So same people show up three days with one week interval, and the reviewer said that's not good enough. Then we had one year later, we did the same thing. So even one year later, obviously there are some changes on the preference, there are some cases, but if you have many of the trial question and answer, some may not and compare it properly, you see some differences between where the subject identity are coming up. How accurate they are? Okay, so again I said there are two different cases. Three or test for looking at the some preference, and then this is one week data, and then so for each trial, they have around 17 to 20 percent accuracy to identify a person out of 20 students. So it's out of 20, so random choice is by person, and our cases come up with 17 to 20, and obviously the test basis is better than pre-learning cases. 
And if you do the whole session level, not the single trial, hundred case trial, it's uh, more than eighty percent right now. Okay, okay, this is the movie I have. Okay, I skip this part. This is the demo video we have done. This is all about the 2015 means of three, almost two and a half years ago. That is before you go on. So they have this computer screen and then they have four different images. You have eyes, tracking device, so on. And then, in summary, I discussed to understand, to measure the brain signal, to understand the internal state and especially whether I agree or disagree or trust or distrust or whether I have the personal preference, etc. So this information is currently measured by MRI or EMT or eye tracking. That's quite uneasy to use at this moment. Although eye tracking may come out in very easy and cheap prices within this year or next year. So some of the people say $100 glass may measure my eye, eye scan and that's actually the target we have. Two by two images is designed for the simple poor eye tracking devices that has very poor resolution. That means it only needs to understand upper left to lower left type of thing. So it's very easy cases. But using that, I can identify the human internal state and then I can utilize that for my conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, thank you very much for a very stimulating talk. For sure. Um, we have a few minutes for questions. Anyone? Yeah, uh, your uh, uh, game playing thing is quite interesting. In fact, a lot of things are being uh, working on the adversarial uh, working. Uh, so, uh, are you somehow using adversarial neural network and video game playing as well? So you could actually, uh, you know, uh, set it up so that your opponent adversary will mm -hmm. actually play their best, so that you continue to improve. Right. Okay. So. What I'm having here is basically the cognitive science experiment. It is different from the game we may need on the classification training. But again, the game is good tactic. You have uh, the spear and how you call it? Yeah. So the game usually has in my game, we have two different games we play and also compare the differences. One is two are collaborating to each other. That means the benefit or outcome of two different players. So just to sum up, they make it maximum. The other case is the two players are competing to each other. So that's in the adversary cases. If they, in some cases, they don't care what the other guys are doing. Taking, they just try to maximize their own the benefit, but the maximum of both players doesn't come together. So if one player got maximum, the other may not have the maximum. So they are competing situation. So that's the way we design the experiment. Is there any the differences coming between them? I guess the idea is not just to win the game, but you want to study the emotion. Right. We want to study how you can predict the other guy's behavior. And then that prediction or understanding the other guy's behavior may be classified by brain signal. That's the main thing. At the later time, again, I'm trying to utilize that to label my audio video data for similar situations. So would you say it's a hypothesis or have you shown that or proven that? Yeah, I set up hypothesis and the brain signal will come up with the approval of the hypothesis because in the binary cases I have 75% accuracy 
also in the cognitive science hypothesis, a, we, the majority of people use so hypothesis test. So the, they come up with test the hypothesis with one person accuracy. Other questions? Okay, this one is quite different from the other talks, right? So all the others, uh, they already have the data, and they have formulated the problem and how they can train, how we can train the network for their opponent. But this one is before that, I said, if you want to look for new experiment, okay, try to go where no one has done before, then you don't have any data at all, so you need to collect your data by yourself. And especially when you're interested in internal state brain, there is no label method available at this moment. So I thought even that kind of thing, how to do experiment, how to come up with the method to label them, that's the thing we need to study. I guess if not, then we're right on time. It's 12 minutes, so thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs> okay, we'll be back at 1:30, uh, and Ren will be giving his second talk. A very most interesting talk, actually, for the end. See you then.